To start the talk, I want to introduce uh, the key members of the uh, research uh, team. Obviously, uh, for some reason, the picture doesn't look like right. I look like a very excited. That's me. Um, <laughs> Francois Xavier is the director of uh, uh, Felix and uh, the charity who uh, founded us for four, well, four and a half years. Uh, Louis is the uh, clinician. Uh, he's been working with Lyme patients for over 30 years. Uh, we constantly have a conversation between me and Louis. Um, sometimes becomes very aggressive, but there's no damage done, it was um, all good. Um, that's Martha. Uh, Martha is the head of a research group of 25 people. Um, as a Lyme research, we also sort of have a subgroup of um, five or six people. Um, besides me, that's, uh, that's my uh, uh, dear wife, um, Ying. Um, but that's a different Ying. It's uh, Professor Zhang's surname is Ying. In Chinese, uh, so my wife is Ying, because um, the whole pronunciation system completely uh, destroyed the Chinese language. Um, but anyway, that's completely two different names. Um, right, um, life before the research, um, I thought well, probably uh, I introduced myself a little bit more. Um, I did my PhD from Warwick University of Warwick. It's, um, it's a university sitting on the side of Coventry uh, in the middle of England. And then before uh, uh, my PhD, I spent all my time in China. I'm a Chinese, obviously. Right. Um, uh, this is a city called Tianjin. That's where I spent three of my good years doing a post, oh, sorry, master degree. Um, I'm not stupid. Um, the reason for three years is uh, just how it goes in China. If you want a master, you need to spend three years. As I only realized that when I was in the UK, so it only takes one year to do a master degree. It's so unfair. But anyway, right, my first degree is in a city called Jinan. That's my hometown. Uh, that's four years. Um, so that's, oh God, that's seven years, isn't it? Uh, okay. Right, uh, my postdoc life. I started with C. difficile, Clostridium difficile. That's back to uh, 2007. I still have loads of hair. And it's not fair, because the ladies, they don't change that much, and then I only have 50% of my hair left. And then after three years on C. difficile, I move on a uh, bacteria called the Burkholderia pseudomalia. Nobody has ever heard of this bacteria, but I work on it for three years. And I'm very, very lucky because this project is a collaboration between UK and Thailand. And I got to visit Thailand twice. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy it. And after that, there's a period of some meditation um, of unemployment. Uh, Six months into my meditation, I got a phone call from Martha. Basically, I still remember that phone call. Hello, Jingyu, how is life? Good, good, good to spend some time with my children. And do you want to come back? Um, and then Martha mentioned something like a Borrelia I never heard of. And then, well, on the second thought, I thought, I have a mortgage to pay, and why not? So I joined the group um, 2015, generally. 20, 20th of January 2015, that's the day I started. I put my hat on because I got no hair left. It's really cold. Um, right, bacteriophages. Um, I'm very, very happy to talk. I always got overexcited with bacteriophages. Uh, the first thing you need to know is they are absolutely everywhere. So the number, those are the, oh, sorry. Those are the very big numbers, you can read them. But I want to point to this uh, lovely picture there. This is not a galaxy. This is a scoop of seawater. So you get a scoop of seawater, you put a bit of fluorescence dye, and under microscope, that's what you see. 
Old big dogs are bacteria and the protozoa. The small ones, they all bacteriophages. So the number of bacteriophages, generally speaking, is 10 times more than bacteria. And the recent, if you read the recent paper, there is estimation that in human bodies, there are 10 times more bacteria than your human cells. And then there's 10 times more bacteriophages. So the number of bacteriophages is absolutely phenomenal. Right, and they are tiny. When I see they are tiny, that's two pictures. This is the typical spirochetes you can, uh, and that's as phages. Um, we're talking about nanometers. So um, generally speaking, the phages is 50 times smaller than the material. Um, it comes with all different sizes and shapes, just like us. But those three guys are the dominant ones, and almost 90% of the phages we discovered from the environment, they all fall into these three uh, uh, morphologies. Those are the some phages I've, I've been lucky enough to work with um, all these years. And um, I just pointed there, that's a 100,000 times magnification of that. Um, life cycles. Um, Basically, there are two different life cycles. We call it lysogenic cycle or lytic cycle. So for lysogenic cycle or lytic cycle, they all start from absorption. So the phages absorb to a bacteria, and then they inject the genetic material into the bacteria. And these inner genetic material have two rules to follow. They can either stay inside the bacteria or follow the lytic cycle ways. So for lytic, lytic phages, the phage will get in, produce babies, and come out. But for lysogenic phage, they will stay inside the bacteria, either become part of the bacterial genome, or they just happily stay there, not coming out. Um, that's all you need to know about bacteria. Um, can you place the can you play the uh, uh, video? So the you should be able to play. I tried it back home. Yes, brilliant. So this is the, um, you can find it from YouTube. It's um, basically bacteriophage T4. It's a lytic phage. They made this cartoon, which is absolutely amazing. It's a phage flying. Once they find a bacteria, they attach to it. They, they hold on this really tight. And then what they're trying to do, they're going to drill a hole. Right, they're gonna drill a hole, and then what they do, they squeeze, they squeeze the genetic material, DNA or RNA, right inside the bacteria, so it's started. And then once the uh, genetic material get inside into the bacteria, and then they started propagating, they're making their own proteins, to form the phage particles. And once those particles are completely um, mature, and then that's what's gonna happen, they're gonna burst out. Come on. Yeah, that's it. And then the new, new cycle was started. Um, right, because um, the last couple of years, not couple of, the last decades have seen a, a dramatic increase in phage therapy. Phage therapy basically just to, uh, to thera uh, therapeutically to use phage to treat human bacterial infections. And uh, the whole idea of phage therapy, oh, because of the gloomy future of antibiotic resistance, those millions, millions of people is going to be killed without antibiotics to use. And it's absolutely a global threat. So for us, we are phage biologists. So um, generally, what, what, what is phage therapy? It's a therapeutic use, but the, the concept and the, the practice of phage therapy is not really new. It's been going on in Russia for about 80 years. So you, if you go to Russia, you can buy phage solutions over counter. And then uh, my boss, Martha, got one of those back into the lab. And um, 
add a little bit of a taste, it doesn't taste very well. It's basically just, according to the, uh, the Russian colleagues, it basically takes LB. They use LB to ferment uh, bacteria and they did filtration, and that's essentially LB. Um, and then there's currently more and more funding available for phage research. And then fortunately, the big pharmaceutical company, they started showing interest in phage research. And, and there are certainly some products, phage products on market. And, and phages are regarded as um, GRAS, generally recognized as safe. Um, so it's good news then. Um, yeah, we need uh, we need focus a bit more on phage research. So yeah, okay. How can you find phages? Because phages are everywhere, and then as a rule of thumb, we where is the bacteria? There is phages, and this example is the uh, the project going with Bacodaria pseudomalia project. That's uh, that's Thailand. I spent about two weeks sampling half of Thailand. Um, basically, it's, it's quite a physical. It's basically, you're digging uh, and um, uh, stealing dirty water, really. And then we send all the samples back into the Thailand lab. Obviously, you're not allowed to bring those samples back to the UK, but we did every the upstream work, uh, phage application um, isolation in Thailand. And then a typical phage isolation procedure will involve uh, making a petri dish. Is you grow bacteria in a petri dish into a lawn, and then you seriously diluted your sample. You spot it on the lawn. If there is any lytic activities, what you can see is clearing. With serial dilutions, they will see individual spots. Each spot is a phage. Right, this is an example of a real lab. Uh, so each individual plug is representing a phage propagation. Right, um, <clears throat> how much do we know about Borrelia phages? Um, not really much. If you dig literature, they take you all the way back to 1983. So that's some lovely convincing pictures of phages attacking to Borrelia cells. Um, and then they even managed to get that phage purified into a um, product, not the product, sorry. They get them purified into a pack, into a pellet. And then they take all these lovely pictures and you see those phages grouped together. Um, but that pretty much is this. Um, the only lytic phage is weak, I can manage to find from literature in spread out into a sparachy is these two. Um, Leptospera, they are not Borrelia, but they're close enough to, uh, to Borrelia. Those are the only two lytic phages has been uh, discovered, sequenced, and uh, fully characterized. So, Rickettsia. Um, <clears throat> there are reports in Rickettsia phages, those are the phages uh, attacking uh, Rickettsia cells. And um, even Bartonella, there's, uh, there are some phage-like particles from Bartonella cultures. So it's not completely blank. There are, there are some um, phages out there. And then this is, this is will answer Armin's question. Where's Armin? He's not there. He asked me the question and then he ran away. So have we found any phages? Um, yes, we found some phages, um, which this is one of those, the Borrelia phages, um, which um, this is the long we made, and we spot, this is um, the clear he's produced. We basically, we take the clear, we purify them. That's one of the TEM pictures. As you can see, there's loads of rubbish around. And then, uh, Ying managed to, uh, to get the column purification working, and then we find those two rather attractive phage particles. Um, still, we are currently at the stage of purification. Um, the re it's turned out to be really, really difficult than uh, we have anticipated. Uh, 
the simple reason is uh, how you grow Borrelia. We grow Borrelia in a super rich medium. There's loads of different proteins, and phages basically proteins. That's how we purify them. So now we're sort of in a in a process of finding the the, the right technique to extract those phages from those protein soup, essentially. Um, right, I just fresh the current problems, um, the big numbers on Lyme, uh, the lack of uh, diagnostics, and, and we need, uh, obviously, we need a, a much better diagnostics uh, how phage can help. Uh, if you look into literature, there there is PCR diagnostics targeting phage, uh, sorry, uh, Lyme patients. But if you, uh, if, you, if you see here that the most challenging one is from blood and serums. Um, so that's some, something we need. It's probably applied to all the diagnostics. Um, we need high sensitivity. We need a reliable, we need to, the, the test to be able to tell co-infections. Uh, ideally, we also need a test to be able to tell clinicians which bacteria is causing the problems. Um, right, um, and then the idea of using phage not as a therapeutic particle, but as a, a diagnostic marker, uh, trace back to my um, C. difficile um, postdoc um, period. Uh, we got this. Um, this is essentially a phylogenetic tree based on uh, bacteriophages. is not based on Clostridium difficile. So what you can see is Clostridium difficile is grouped into different uh, clays. So the idea is if you are targeting the phages carried by the bacteria, you can identify that bacteria, the presence of, of that bacteria, and that is because the number of phages is much more than the number of bacteria. And then I essentially did exactly the same as I did to the Clostridium difficile, and I made this tray, as you can see, the Lyme disease and the relapsing fever are naturally separated. And then what we did is design primer probes targeting all of these individual Borrelia strains. And we did whatever we can think of um, for the PCR optimization. And that's two years of lab work. I'll just summarize it a little bit. Um, obviously, the, the primer and the probes is, shouldn't really pick up a human DNA. And because if you extract DNA out of human blood, 99.99% are human DNA. It's only a tiny bit is um, bacteria DNA. So we tested that idea. Um, firstly, um, is the, the, the phage PCR primer probes is not picking up anything from human DNA. And then if you run the PCR in the background of human DNA, you have exactly the same efficiency as you run the PCR against um, bacteria DNA. So the bacteria, uh, human DNA has no interference into the, uh, uh, the performance of the uh, phage PCR. And that is absolutely specific. It's not amplifying other but, but really strains. Because in the lab, we have a collection of 30 something human pathogens. We tried all of, all of them. We did a, a thorough um, in silico PCR just to make sure they are specific, they're not amplifying uh, rubbish. Right, this is the uh, sum of the data. Uh, currently, we have tested three cohorts of patient samples. Um, it goes back to my previous question and asked because there's no gold standard. Um, I don't think there's any gold standard. So what we did, I, I, I just blocked that, I just don't want to confuse you. And there's 96 patients. Those are the properly uh, clinically diagnosed by Lu Yi. So those 96 patients, if you run through the phage PCR, what you can see, you have 88 positive and eight negatives. So that's a total 96 that give you the positive rate. And then, if I block those, if you see the serological results, all of 96 has been done serological results. The positive is 15, the negative is 81. So you have a 16% positive. 
positive rate. Um, it's a very complicated table. The reason I make it is because you see the 15 patients, they are positive for serological, they are positive for phage PCR. So there's an agreement between um, serological results and PCR results. Um, we even compare this 96 with the bacteria uh, qPCR, which is the one targeting Borrelia 16S. As. as you can see, the uh, phage PCR is a lot more sensitive compared to uh, the bacteria PCR. We've got all this uh, sensitivity rate down here. And then we went on to the second cohort, which is um, last year, around May, that's 82 individuals that include uh, healthy volunteers, uh, early patient, and then late patients. There's a, one question we won't ask, which is, which one is better? So we have serum and blood from each single patient, which one is better? And then, as you can see, it's pretty much very similar for late and healthy volunteers. But for early patients, you have a lot more positive from whole blood rather than from serum. And another varying fact is the healthy volunteer, they're 48% positive. Um, I get so worried, I sequence all of them. And then they all really and nothing else. And then I check all the controls, positive controls, negative controls our positive serial dilutions, our extraction controls, everything fine, it works fine. So the only possibility as I can think of is those healthy volunteer and not really healthy volunteer, they're just asymptomatic carriers. And then later on, only later on, when I talked with Lu Yi, and uh, Lu Yi accidentally told me those healthy volunteer are hospital workers. Those are the people working in hospitals. So they're not really, truly representing the general public. So, and, but anyway, it's good to, uh, to have uh, something to discuss. Um, <clears throat> right, that's the, the latest cohort. Uh, we, <clears throat> we're just about to finish. I just share one of the uh, screenshot, which is, um, I think is extremely interesting. Um, see, that's five patients, one, two, three, four, five. All of these patients, those are the stages, um, late stage, early, 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 but all of them tested serological negative. For each patient, we ran three PCRs. As you can see, those are the copy numbers per PCR. None of them gave three positives, three um, um, copy numbers. They all give numbers, but those numbers are below 10. So 10, analytically speaking, is our detection limit. So what, we, what we can learn from here is, by the way, we sequence all the products, they over really products. So uh, what we can learn is, although those patients are below the qPCR detection limit, but they are positive. The way I'm saying it, well, if you present this data, they won't believe it, because you see, your, your tr my triplicate don't agree to each other, but they are positive. I know they're positive because I sequence the product. And digital PCR. <laughs> I confirm it with digital PCR, because the digital PCR has a much lower detection limit. They, have, they can detect one copy per PCR. For the qPCR, the one tag man based is 10 copy numbers. So it basically just, just tell us something like um, the bacteria is there, but the number is very low. It's below the technology. So te that's how the technology can tell you. But if you read the technology, basically the te technology tells you the patient is negative. But the reality is the patient is not negative. They have the bacteria, it just somehow the bacteria is so low, it's below the detect limit of the current um, method. But we can use digital PCR. The only concern for digital PCR is it's extremely expensive. 
at least in my institute, they charge me 15 pounds for each well. So 96 well plays. How many are going to pay for that? There's no way you can, I, we can afford that kind of price. But um, oh, this is just one of the, I oh, completely forgot that one. This is one of the patients. They, they are the one's patient, and it's a um, serological negative. See, they agree, because they're above 10 copies. They're above 10 copies, they above my detection limit. So it's, this is, I can confidently say, it's a positive patient. So yeah. Right, um, just a little bit update on the diagnostic side of our work. Um, it's all driven by, uh, by my dear wife, Ying, um, for two years. We're very lucky to have funding, not just from Felix, we have funding from University of Leicester. Uh, for two years, that's almost 90,000 pounds from University of Leicester. We are very grateful for the, uh, for the money we received. And um, uh, Red Laboratories has been doing validation in their uh, facility for five months. And there's some, yeah, like, well, very stressful five, five months of time because of whatever we have done in Leicester doesn't necessarily translate it to good, re good results in uh, Brussels, not Brussels, uh, the red laboratories. But again, after five months of um, um, discussion and a debate and uh, miscommunications, <laughs> finally um, I was told, okay, okay, Jin, you, you're good, your test is working, so um, good, good, good to know. So hopefully um, they can somehow have a, have a service or a product. I haven't, I, me personally, I haven't got the uh, uh, time scale, what sort of time they can offer it, but I guess as soon as they uh, have next week, how do you know? <laughs> oh, brilliant. Well done. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, it was really good. Thank you. It was good, good to know. Um, um, right, uh, ticks. Uh, we do have a set project in the, in the, in the, um, in the lab. Uh, we spent about a whole year to establish a volunteering system up down the country. And now we have about 200 volunteers they're sending us ticks on a daily basis. And when we receive the ticks, obviously we kill them. Uh, we, we initially, we do single tick dissection, and then I completely gave up. It's just not possible. It's just killing me, I'm just, uh, just not possible. So we changed the strategies um, by crushing them. <laughs> we just crush them, basically. And then we're not crushing individually, we pull the ticks together, exactly. So those ticks are from the same date, the same collector from the same animals. So if you see that tick is from the um, leaves, uh, not leaves, not leaves, Dundee area, uh, that from a sheep on that particular date. We even have the locations, very exact locations. So, um, and then we come up with this uh, uh, rather scary um, heat map. <laughs> um, uh, I haven't think about the best way to present it, but uh, um, this is how it stands. The red, red spots means positive. Again, it's not single ticks, remember. It's not single ticks. It's a pool of ticks from that location. The red spots only mean that location has uh, positive, positive, have ticks, shows positive, so phage PCR. Obviously, Scotland is the uh, endemic area. Um, I even received a letter from Western Isles. It's a very royal um, tick collector. He, he basically want me to write something to say um, the Western Isles is not endemic area. There's no ticks carrying Borrelia. I just cannot agree. I mean. Basically, I would love to see that, but just that's, I showed the map to, uh, to him. I mean, that, that's, that's the, the data has told me, sorry about that, but uh, if you send me more ticks, I would love to test more ticks, but I just cannot see. Uh, you have no, um, but you have loads of red dots over there, but anyway. 
Um, all of these data are right now in the middle of uh, um, writing up because previously uh, we had this pattern application. I'm not, I'm not allowed to sort of to to publish them now. We all, they all settled, so they're all happy. So I'm, I'm just gonna get it out by the end of the year. Um, further development, obviously, we need um, more controls because it's very varying from the general public can have a, a very high level of uh, PCR positive. And also, uh, whatever we have learned from Borrelia, we want to put them into Bartonella <laughs> and even Rickettsia. Uh, Bartonella project has already uh, slowly started. Um, we found some pot potential like targets. And, and eventually, we want to come up with a somehow, some multiplex PCR, one single PCR will tell you um, what Borrelia strains you are carrying. Uh, is it Borrelia or Bartonella or Rickettsia? Um, probably never gonna be achieved, but that, that's something I'm, I'm working, uh, working for. Um, oh, that's it. Uh, yeah, Martha is the, um, the head of group. Um, the wife, um, Fonso Xavier, is the director of Felix. Uh, Louis is the um, uh, collaborator. That, and uh, all of these, uh, Olamia is the PhD student working on uh, the induction of uh, Borrelia phages. Uh, Pierre, Alizi, Justin, oh God, two Pierre, sorry. That's the same Pierre, that's a uh, typing error. Those are the very talented French students. And then they only spend like four months in the lab. It's just, uh, they, they just help me so much. I just have to um, uh, put them there. Uh, Peter, Peter is the research technician and Faisal is, is a talented, or is a master student, work with me for, for one year in the TIG, uh, TIG dissection project. And I will stop there. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Yinyu. <laughs> Questions for Yinyu? Excellent presentation. Uh, in regard to Bartonella, we are, we were evaluating phages in Bartonella Hensley. There are four species, Hensley, Basiliformis, Quintana, Vinson, Abercofi, that harbor what is called the lysogenic stage of the phages. So that is one well-known gene called PAP31, and PAP stands for phage-associated protein of 31 kilodalton. That's what PAP31 is for. But we found, for example, that even if it's a really good target, uh, there are not all the strains that we are able to screen uh, are infected with these lysogenic uh, phages or bacteriophages. So we are missing probably 10% of the one that we are normally isolating uh, through that method because they are not simply infected. So that, that is one comment. The second one is when you test the one you were doing with Borrelia, are you assuming that they are bursting outside of Borrelia or they still attach to Borrelia or inside of Borrelia? Uh, the Borrelia phages, um, the primer and the design is based on the prophages carried inside the Borrelia. But again, as we have proved in lab, those prophages, they can, what, they call, what we call um, spontaneous release. So if you grow Borrelia, those phages will spontaneously come out of it, the um, uh, bacteria. But that's not gonna be a problem in terms of blood samples. Rather than, so if you think about in the blood, if a Borrelia is circulating the blood and the prophage is constantly pumping out of the Borrelia, but they are still there. See, um, we are essentially targeting circulating bacterial phages. That's the, uh, the whole point. Even, even Borrelia is hiding somewhere the phage can't ha hide. The phage is still gonna circulate it. So that's probably the reason why um, if you compare the phage-based PCR and the bacteria-based PCR, you see this huge difference. 
But Bartonella Fages, I read your paper. Sorry, I forgot to, uh, to mention. That's a, that's a 20, 22, isn't it? That's a good one. Thank you very much. Yeah, so you mentioned that pharmaceutical industry is interested in phages. And I understand that they are naturally occurring entities. You know, phage is naturally occurring. So has there been any attempt to patent phages? Oh, phage patenting has been there for like 10, 20 years. You, you can patent phages. It's absolutely fine. If you can find a good combination. We had a, we had a patent in the lab uh, targeting Clostridium difficile. So that's a six individual phages. You put them together, they can eliminate um, the pathogenic Clostridium difficile. Yeah, you can, you can patent it. Well, because I only mentioned that big pharmaceutical company only started showing interest. There's nothing has been done. They only started showing interest because it's, again, it's very controversial. Phage therapy is quite controversial. It's not as established as an antibiotics. So, and yeah, for, 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 thank you very much. For the diagnosis uh, here. Oh, for the oh, diagnosis. Sorry. As we know, we have several species of Borrelia involved in uh, human uh, disease. Um, your phages will be very specific of one strain, or you'll have to, to use different phages? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Um, the current primum probe we have um, showed in there is the one that will easily pick up Burgdorferi, Afzelia, and Grenii with very high efficiency. But they can, in the meanwhile, they can also pick up Borrelia valesiana, but the efficiency is not as high as those three. So if you have a phage positive, that's one of the issues on our latest uh, validation. And if you have a positive on phage PCR, is we can only guarantee you are three options: you have Burgdorferi, Afzelia, and Grenii. If you got infected by C. Dartonia, we can't read. Oh, Dartonia, relaxed in favor. If you got relax, uh, Spilmania, we can't really see. Is it, is it Spilmania? We have a specific, separate primer probe targeting that particular uh, strain. Mm. Um, you, you, at one point, you compared the. the oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> At one point, you compared the efficacy of, of qPCR on, on phages and uh, on bacteria. But that was from uh, the sera of patients. So uh, one doesn't know if uh, you were, uh, the phages were coming from how many different bacteria. And of course, the dogma is that the phages are specific from one bacteria. But there are publications, and even this year from a Dutch group, saying that the, the specificity is between narrow to broad. And uh, uh, I think that if those phages are to be used for testing for the presence of Borrelia, it would be, for me, very important to show that the most common bacteria that are found in, in uh, that can be found in the blood, and there are several, are several tens, right, yeah. uh, are checked not to host, be able to host. If this has not been uh, proven, we do not know what is the efficacy of this PCR on phages compared to the one on bacteria. The only way to know this efficacy would be to start with a pure culture of Borrelia and to, to make dilutions and to see where does one uh, stops uh, being able to detect them by direct PCR of the bacteria versus phages. Has this been done? Yeah, it's been done. Um, that's probably, that you have to do that. And that's the first thing to do, um, testing pure cultures of a Borrelia, all, all different Borrelia cultures, and even other whatever bacteria we have in the lab we tested them on, um, we can confidently say and the, that set of primer probe um, combination is not picking up any bacteria. Again, you can easily do a in silico PCR. You can run a PCR program, not PCR program, a computer. You can run it on computer to search available database. Uh, it's not picking up anything. So um, it's absolutely specific for, for Borrelia, nothing else.
You mean you're talking about the sensitivity, uh, sorry, not sensitivity. Um, if you compare, in theory, as I mentioned before, you, you can expect 10 times more sens sensitive as a phage-based. But in reality, what the number is six. We compared, uh, if you use a phage-based PCR primer probes and a bacteria-based PCR primer probe to targeting the same sample, so the, uh, the phage-based one is six times more sensitive. Okay, thank you. I, I think we have to, to uh, another one. Okay. Okay. okay, I'll be very quick. What happens when you run saliva or urine or other body fluids compared to blood? We haven't tried the saliva yet. Does it really in saliva? Yes. <laughs> urine for sure. Uh, yeah, urine is definitely on the list. Urine is on the list. Oh, just get people to spit in your lab. It'll work. <laughs> okay, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, the urine is on the list, but saliva is a really good suggestion. I think about it. Thanks. Okay, thank you.